Hi everybody, this is a devil fruit. Um, okay, so, <laughs> uh, this is a weird thing to say at the beginning of a One Piece review, and I understand that, but you need to understand something about this chapter, so I'm gonna say this. Spoiler warning! You might be wondering, why are you giving a spoiler warning for a chapter that's brand new that you're reviewing? Obviously, if you're here, you're okay with spoilers. Okay, but yes, but no, because in this chapter, we find out, like, a lot of information about Devil Fruits, okay? Not every bit of information about Devil Fruits. And it's one of those things where Oda, you know, it, it actually opens up a lot more questions than answers, but that's okay because there's like no information about Devil Fruits for like the first 1,068 chapters of this story or very minimal information. We find a few things out along the way, but not a lot. So uh, this is one of the big chapters where we find out what Devil Fruits really are, um, how do the different kind of powers manifest, why are Devil Fruit users all weak to the sea? Um, those questions are addressed and like kind of answered, but also lead to a lot of other questions in the, in the process. So um, I don't know, I guess. Spoiler warning if you always wanted Devil Fruits to remain a mystery, you know? Maybe there's some people out there that are like, you know, I, I just hoped Oda would never explain Devil Fruits. I want wanted Devil Fruits to be a mystery from day one. Here we are, and now he's explaining them. You know what? I'm done with One Piece, okay? So I guess this is where the series ends for you, I guess. All right, well, anyway, um, it's weird because this is like end game stuff, and, you know, reading a chapter like this, it's, it almost feels like this is like, this is top secret information that Oda was like writing about. Like this is what Devil Fruits are and it wasn't meant for the general public. And here we are, it's like, oh my God, are we at this point in the story already? This is weird, all right? So yeah, I guess, uh, spoiler warning for One Piece chapter 1069 review. Nice, nice. That's the name of the chapter, nice. But no, the actual chapter title is We Owe All There Is to desire! I desire it, Senku! That's a Ryu Sweet reference from Dr. Stone, so I'm glad I'm still able to make those Dr. Stone references, okay? Really good manga, okay. So, uh, we start off with a flashback in the cover story involving the Germa, which in and of itself is a flashback to a couple of weeks ago after the events of Totland. Are you following me with this already? Okay, cool. So we actually get to see, and, and because we're, you know, an egghead right now, and we're dealing with Vegapunk and everything, Oda is just using the cover series at this point to uh, give us some backstory for Vegapunk because a lot of times Oda will not be able to include every little chunk of backstory he has for a character or an organization. Often he'll just reveal a lot of that stuff in the SBS or a data book somewhere and he's always like man I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit more detail but I just didn't have time okay. Uh, Zoro's whole connection at Wano is sort of like one of those things and we still don't even know everything about that but now that Oda has the cover series and it's already involving the Germa which is led by Judge, who used to work for Mads, underneath Vegapunk, this works perfectly. So we actually get to see what the Mads uh, organization looked like, okay? So way back in the day, we still don't have like a definitive timeline for this. We know that 22 years ago, when Dragon met Vegapunk at O'Hara, six months after the, uh, the Buster call, at that point, Vegapunk was already working for the government, okay? But it was implied by Dragon to be a recent change in his employment, all right? So I don't know what it means by recent change, like if he had just started working for the government that year, or maybe a few years prior to that, but you know, before he worked for the government, he worked for his own organization, his own thing he kind of set up called MADS. So we see the ship, we see MADS, the scientists of peace, and uh, we see, it's, a, it's actually a really interesting looking ship. It's not like a standard ship that's like really long. It's like super, super short, but tall, you know? It kind of looks like a, like a toy tugboat or something that you would find in a dog store and you would like play with in the bathtub or something like that. It looks more of like a bath toy than it does a ship, okay? But it has Mads stenciled across the uh, side of it and it has a flag that it's flying that literally just says pacifist. Not pacifista, pacifist.
pacifist, and the title is uh, The Scientists of Peace, The Laboratory of Peace, okay? So that makes sense, the idea that Vegapunk, from what we see with his ideologies and his dreams, you know, from, you know, wanting to create the internet and, you know, an unlimited energy source for the people of the world and trying to end all war, um, that's like Vegapunk's whole idea. He's like, I will use science for good, you know? I don't know why we assumed that MADS was like an organization of evil scientists. I think because it had MADS in the title, like they're MAD scientists. And you know, that's not fair. Just because you're a mad scientist doesn't mean you're an evil scientist, all right? That's just, that's too judgy right there, okay? You can be a mad scientist for good. Like, it's totally possible for you to be a scientist with wild, unkempt hair and a handlebar mustache and one glass eye and an old stitched up lab coat swirling a beaker around and be like, I am a mad scientist! <laughs> I will use my science! to cure all diseases on the planet for the betterment of society. <laughs> you could totally be that guy. And apparently Vegapunk and a lot of the other scientists in MADS were those kind of scientists, all right? Something else, though, that's interesting about it, and it also, by the way, that's the name of the origin for the Pacifista, where the government's like, you know, okay, Vegapunk, we want you to make a bunch of death robot terminators that go around and nuke everything with lasers. And Vegapunk's like, can I name them whatever I want? It's like, what? Yeah, sure, whatever. Name whatever you want to name them. I'm like, okay, I will name them the Pacifistas after pacifists. And the government's like, okay, that makes zero sense for what we ordered, but as long as they do the laser shit, we don't care. And they walked away. But something else we found out here is that the person, remember when Vegapunk was talking to Dragon, and Dragon was like, you know, I can't believe you joined the government, Vegapunk. I thought you would have joined the Freedom Fighters with me. And Vegapunk's like, you guys are too poor. You know, in order to have, like, science, in order to build all my inventions, I need money. I need resources, right? So the government is obviously funding his operation right now, but what about Mads? What about before he was a member of the government? Where was all the money coming from? And this is a great callback. He was actually funded by the loan shark king, Dufeld. Or on the side of the boat, it actually is spelled out finally, because this is the first time we're seeing his name spelled. So his name is actually pronounced or spelled uh, Lufeld, not Dufeld. All right, so that's just like a translation thing, okay? So he is the loan shark king that appeared at Big Mom's tea party, okay? And uh, he was there. He's the one that like arrived with like Stussy and everybody, and they sang the song. Okay, and he actually eventually, I think he was killed by Stussy because he had the Tate uh, box, you know, the Tate Bako, and he was about to open it up. And then Stussy like shot him in the back with the flying she gone, and I think he's dead, okay? So I actually did a video on the Underworld Kingpins not long ago, so go check that out. But the thing is that each one of them kind of run a particular business, like an actual legitimate business in the One Piece world, and then they have like a part of their business that goes into the underground, the underworld, the black market, the mafia, that kind of stuff stuff, okay? So, uh, Lou Feld is the, uh, is the head of the Lou Feld conglomerate, all right? That was the only thing we got about his actual business name, and I think in that video, I, uh, I theorized that maybe he was the head of, like, banking or something. Like, every bank in the world is actually headed up by Du Feld, and then he uses all that money, of course, to run this secret organization, you know, uh, you know, the loan sharking and everything like that, like a mafia kind of business behind the scenes. So, something I actually recently found found out was uh, Lou Feld's actually based on a real world tycoon businessman kind of guy and his name was, I actually did write it down, I never heard of him, Sheldon Adelson. He died last year but he was the head, uh, he started a bunch of like casino resorts kind of thing, okay? So I think maybe that's more of probably Lou Feld's speed. He runs a bunch of like casinos, like this guy might run Vacation Island, okay? Like he runs those kind of resort islands and then that's his like legitimate business practice and then behind the scenes he's doing doing all this mafioso stuff. So it, he, it mentions it's a, philan a philanthropic endeavor by Lou Feld and his conglomerate. Okay, so he was the one funding the operation for Mads, probably because of his own gain, okay? Because he does he's a businessman, he does everything for his own gain. So I bet, you know, Vegapunk and the rest of the mad scientists like Queen and Judge came to him at one point and sat down and uh, told them, like, oh, we want to build a ship and we want to sail around the world and perform science for the betterment of mankind. 
kind. And uh, Lou Feld's probably like, yeah, I can make money off this. We can package this. You know what I mean? You know, any invention that you make, maybe we could sell. And he's like, well, we don't want to sell it. We just want to give it out. And he's like, all right, we'll figure that out later. But anyway, Lou Feld saw money in, in Vegapunk's operations, so he funded it, okay? And then at some point, the government got involved, broke up Mads, and then, uh, you know, Vegapunk started getting money directly from them as funding, you know, in order to build a head island where we're at right now. Okay, so now getting into the actual chapter, it feels like just the cover page took forever. That was like a review in and of itself. Okay, so we're on Egghead Island, right? The Cypher Pull Zero is going crazy. You know, Luchi just, you know, uh, you know, Roku Ogond Atlas in the face. She's down. All the scientists on the island are running. They are scrambling. They are evacuating, okay? Uh, it's like, they got Dr. Atlas! And so they're running. We see uh, there's a lady that has a shirt or like the outfit, you know, the futuristic outfit that says stats on it so most likely she is a status st statistician statistician yeah that's that's a science right that's a that's a branch and there's this other dude that uh, has macro eco written on his sleeve and he's running so i'm thinking uh macro uh macro not economy i mean maybe macro e economics maybe but no macro ecology right that's a thing right that's when you like study the way that like on a bigger scale so like the way the climate would like affect all the different animals on the planet like macro uh, ecology let's let's go with that anyway so they're running away and uh, we have Luffy's group that has just there they have Bonnie with them and they're trying to get up to the labo sphere they're running and they just see oh wait Pigeon guy, what are you doing here? So Luffy just sees Luchi for the first time in two years since the last time he punched him out at Eni's lobby. And he's like, oh, hey, man, what's up? And Luchi, you know what? I really love the way, oh, Chopper's freaking out, obviously. He's like, oh, no, it's Rob Luchi. Oh, no, not again. Why? And so Luchi's response there, he, he turns back into his human form because he was in his hybrid form to defeat Atlas. So he goes back into his human form. Hattori is there, and Hattori immediately begins to fly away because, like, Hattori where he's like senses the battle is coming and uh, he flies away. But Luchi, you know, despite being punched out by Luffy before and being a, a main antagonist in another arc that Luffy, that was like Luffy's main arrival at that point, um, He's not, he doesn't really show any kind of animosity toward Luffy, right? It's, it's not a kind of situation where, you know, Luffy's there and Luchi, they lock eyes and Luchi's like, Straw Hat, I've been waiting for my revenge against you. You know, it's nothing like that. And it makes sense. Luchi is an assassin. Yes, he does have a little bit of the bloodlust because of his leopard zone. Uh, we're definitely going to see that later in the chapter, but he's a professional. At the end of the day, he was raised to be a professional assassin, okay? So he doesn't really exhibit a kind of like animosity or like rage like directly toward Luffy, you know, where it's like, you know, you beat me once Straw Hat, now I have to beat you. Now, that does happen, but it happens in a much more kind of like chill way, if, if that makes sense, okay? So anyway, uh, Luchi actually has a really good rebuttal to this when Luffy asks him, you know, what are you doing here, pitching guy? Still doesn't know his actual name. And then Luchi is like, you know this is a government island, right? And Luffy's like, yeah, well, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess we're the ones kind of out of place on this place. It's sort of like way back, um, actually, I think this was in a filler. Yeah, no, wait, yeah, no, yeah, it was, okay. It was a filler and it wasn't. It was at the end of Long Ring, Longland, after the Davy back, when uh, in the anime, the Straw Hats find like a group of uh, stranded, like uh, shipwreckies, I guess that's the term, people that have been shipwrecked. And uh, <laughs> they're like, hey, uh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna help you. And then Aokiji's there and is like, oh, I'll help you. And Luffy's like, hey, don't trust him. He's part of the Marines. And the, all the shipwrecked people are like, yeah, he's part of the Marines. So what, is that a problem? And Luffy's like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess to regular people, I guess the pirates are the bad guys and Aokiji is the good guy. Yeah, I get, okay, yeah, listen to what he says then, yeah. Um, in the manga, this happens with Tonjit on Long Ring Longland, okay? So it's like the same scene, but it happens with different characters. So it's kind of like that where Luffy's like, who, what are you doing here? Oh wait, yeah, I guess this isn't, yeah, this is a government island. You're part of the government. Yeah, okay, no, yeah, no, it's cool. All right, carry on, I guess. Actually, it's funny, 
Luffy was sort of kind of just, they were like both kind of, well, Luchi I think was going to go fight Luffy no matter what because he really wanted to kind of test his metal. It's less about getting revenge on Luffy and more about Luffy being the only person that has bested Luchi in combat in that way. And so Luchi just kind of wants to see how much stronger he's gotten, all right, since the last time he fought Luffy. It's, it's more about that than it is like any kind of grudge against Luffy. So honestly, to tell you the truth, Luffy doesn't even seem like he's going to fight Luchi here. Um, they're kind of on their way to the Labosphere, and Jinbei even says, like, Luffy, forget them, let's go, hurry up, okay? And it seems like Luffy's just gonna be like, alright, well, anyway, nice to see you, pigeon guy, later, and then they're just gonna go. Um, Luchi, on the other hand, is kind of like, hmm, alright. Now, uh, Kaku is there, and he's like, oh, dearie me, it seems Straw Hat Luffy is here with Jewelry Bonnie after all. Hmm, now that throws a wrench into our works a little bit. A monkey wrench, you would say. My comedy routine is going to be premiering on uh, some kind of station special coming soon. But anyway, no, it's a monkey wrench. You get it? Okay. Anyway, um, this is the first time in the story we're really getting the weight behind Luffy now being a Yonko. All right? Under normal circumstances, when Luffy was just an ordinary pirate, or just like a, a particularly strong pirate, like a member of the Supernovas, um, Luchi, Kaku, Stussy, the other members of Cypher Pole, they would just like attack them, right? Because there's no reason why they can't. But now that Luffy is a straight up Yonko, now we're getting like bureaucracy involved into this. Now it's like a complicated political thing where Luffy literally embodies one-fourth of one of the three greatest powers on the entire planet, okay? And it's like this power power balance that always has to be maintained. So Kaku mentions, like, we can't do anything now. We can't attack them. Luffy and his crew are part of, are the Yonko now. It's officially been declared. And Stussy even brings up that, like, yeah, that's right. Emperors have a lot of power and a lot of sway behind them. Even a small conflict could result in an all-out war, okay? Now, Luffy, granted, is, is a new Yonko, okay? And a lot of the other Yonko, they've had, like, decades or, you know, a lot of years to establish themselves. Like, Big Mom established herself at Totland. She has, like, her own country she rolls over. Kaido kind of had the same thing with Wano. Um, you know, Whitebeard had a lot of territories. Shanks has a lot of territories. Uh, Luffy has a few places that he's declared safe, you know, but he, he's definitely not not as set up as all like built up as all the other Yonko were. However, Cypher Pole Zero doesn't know that. <laughs> they don't really know the extent of Luffy's reach at this point, okay? Uh, he's got the Grand Fleet, certainly, which is a threat in and of itself, um, but it doesn't matter. It's like we can't, like, you know, the Cypher Pole are not allowed to just, like, on their own, just go fight Big Mom or go fight Whitebeard whenever they want to, okay? Because if they, th that's how you have to understand how absolutely powerful the Yonko are, all right, in this world. They are not just, like, pretty strong pirates that do their own thing. No, they are a literal political force in and of themselves for how strong they have become, okay? So it's like, yeah, like, look what happened at Marineford when Whitebeard got pissed off and attacked because of Ace's execution. Yeah, the Marines were able to win at the end of the day, but it could have went any other way. You know, you can't say the Marines just, like, beat Whitebeard and, you know, oh, that was easy. No, it could have easily went on Whitebeard's end and he could have wiped out the bulk of the Marines fighting force, okay? So that's the kind of level of crap we're dealing with here, you know? And so they're like, we, we can't just attack Straw Hat Luffy. We need to get permission from the higher-ups, which means the Gorosei. They, not, they need to get permission from the Gorosei in order to uh, like even uh, attempt anything against a Yonko, okay? So, and for that reason, you know, they're not attacking Luffy. Luffy has other places to be, so he's about ready to go. When he looks over, though, and he sees Atlas. He sees Atlas's body on the ground, like, smoldering. You know, we do see some, I don't know if it's blood or if it's oil or something, but we see, like, a liquid, you know, off her, like, you know, off her eyes and her nose and everything. So, you know, and I, I like to think she's, like, partly organic and then partly mechanical, like a Terminator. Anyway, she's on the ground, not moving, not saying anything. Smoke is just billowing out of her head. And, it, you know, it doesn't take Luffy very long to figure out what happened. And just like, hey, it's that kid from before. Four, which is also speaks to Luffy's innocence where, you know, Atlas is like the size of Kaido and is like throwing punches that like level buildings. But to Luffy, you know, 
she's just this really kind kid that gave them food, you know, from the vending machine, all right? That's how Luffy just, he's a very simple kind of character in that regard. That's just how he views her. So, you know, that's one thing to get on Luffy. I just made a video about this too. You know, if you want to get on the, you know, Luffy shit list, it's mess with any kind of food or his friends or somebody that has given him food, okay? So here we are, all right? So yeah, but just keep in mind, like, if this would have went a different way, uh, if Luffy did not see Atlas or if Luchi did not defeat Atlas, uh, Luffy might have just left and might have just went up to the lab and Luchi would have been like, all right, and if Luffy would have just listened to the orders and the command structure, he wouldn't have done anything either. So because of their character motivations, they do stuff that are different, but like that just gives you a whole idea of like the, uh, the political intrigue, I guess, into the world government and what they're allowed to do and stuff like that, okay? So Luchi begins to walk toward Luffy. And I think Luchi also realizes that, like, okay, Luffy's obviously upset that I KO'd this, you know, giant kid, so obviously he's gonna be coming after me now. I'm gonna fight him. And Kaku and Stussy are like, Luchi, you can't! And just like, I understand the consequences. I'm gonna fight him. And just like, alright, I guess, but why? Please don't! You know? Uh, Luffy takes, uh, well, first of all, he looks over to uh, Chopper, and he's like, Chopper, do what you can for her! You're a doctor, Chopper! And Chopper's like, I don't, she's like billowing steam. There's like electrical, like, can I even get close to her without being electrocuted? It's like a downed power line or something. This is more of Frankie's uh, forte. This is what Frankie kind of does. So that's, hey, maybe that's where Frankie's gonna get involved here. Frankie, Frankie has to do stuff in this arc. I mean, come on, he's got to, all right? So Frankie and Chopper working together could maybe repair Atlas. That could, that could maybe work, right? So uh, Chopper's like, all right, I'll do what I can for her. I guess she's bleeding. Oh, wait, no, that's oil. No, is that transmission fluid? All right, whatever. Um, uh, being a doctor, being a mechanic, it's all about connecting the tubes the right way and making sure nothing leaks, okay? We'll, we'll be good, I guess, all right? So uh, Luffy looks over to Luchi and just super serious, he tosses Bonnie over to Jinbei, just like, Jinbei, you take her, get out of here. That kid gave us food. Now you're gonna pay, pigeon guy. All right, so just remember, that's why they're fighting right now, okay? Because Luchi just wants to test his metal, and uh, they defeated Atlas, who gave Luffy food. Honestly speaking, it wasn't even Atlas that gave them food. It was the vending machine. I'm sure if, like, Luffy would have just pushed enough buttons that he would have figured out how the machine would have worked, right? If, uh, if Luchi, parallel dimension here, Luchi accidentally punches, like, he punches a building and it falls over and crushes the vending machine, would Luffy therefore, like, that vending machine was my friend, it gave us food! <laughs> Would Luffy defend the honor of the vending machine? I just, I, I wonder, I wonder with Luffy, I don't know. Alright, so now we cut over to Navy HQ, we head over to Marine Headquarters, formerly G1, now it's Marine HQ. We see Akainu there meeting with some random Marines, there's one Marine that has like this really long neck with like a tattoo on it. Um, he might actually be a member of the Snake Neck Tribe for all we know, there's not a lot of members of the Snake Neck Tribe that we see. Uh, in the story. Actually, I think we've yet to see a full-blooded member of the Snake Neck tribe um, because the members of the Big Mom family, like Amande and everybody, they were half-human because of Big Mom being their mother. So, I don't know. This is a Marine. He has a really long neck. He has a tattoo. And uh, with I, I know at least with the Long Leg tribe, they like to wear a lot of leg tattoos because of their long legs. So, it might be something similar with the Snake Necks. Who knows? I don't think we've seen this guy before, though. Anyway, so... Um, Akainu's there meeting with them, he's smoking his cigar, and he's like, so that old man Vegapunk, he's on to us, isn't he? He knows about CP0 trying to assassinate him, and he's like, yeah, it seems so, Akainu, sorry. Uh, they uh, weren't allowed access to Egghead, so they burst in on their own. Um, so uh, what about Kizaru? He's like, yeah, Kizaru left for Egghead as already planned. All right, so that, mm, stop for that for a moment. Now we have Kizaru heading to the island as planned. Why was Kizaru planning on going to the island anyway? Um, because if Cypherpole was going, maybe, okay, maybe the Way that they planned on this going is if Cypher Pole went and then maybe they were just supposed to be recon or something and then you know Vegapunk tells them you know you're not allowed to dock here and then CP0 should have just left and then that's when, Ak uh, not Akainu, that's when Kizaru shows up and actually deals with the problem so maybe they were planning on Vegapunk figuring it out anyway and just sending Kizaru as like a backup you know it's like okay if they let the CP0 on the island then just let them do their thing however if Vegapunk does not allow them on the island just ask CP0 to retreat, 
and then we'll send Kizaru, and then he'll deal with it, okay? And so maybe maybe that was the plan. But at any rate, Kizaru is flying. Now remember, Kizaru is like the fastest character in One Piece. Uh, I don't know if he can move at straight up light speed, but he can move pretty fast. So it's probably not going to take him very long to zip around to the uh, other side of the new world or whatever. He'll he'll be there pretty quickly. But he also is, um, he, he likes to take his time with stuff too. It depends on the motivation he's dealing with right now and uh, how much pot he smoked this morning. But, you know, Kizaru will probably be there pretty damn soon considering his ability, okay? So Kizaru is going to be on the island now. This is like Saba Odi all over again where there's like a million really strong characters on the same island at the same time. Where is this going? We got Luchi, we got Vegapunk Satellites, we got the whole Straw Hats, we got Cypher Pole Zero, we got now Kizaru arriving, right? Like, what, where is this going? We got Bonnie there. Like, oh my god. I've got the Seraphim as well, which are basically all of the warlords. <laughs> so that's another thing, okay. So Akainu brings up the big thing here, and he says, you know, if Vegapunk has really cut ties with the Marines and the government, if he's defected from the government to join Luffy, a Yonko, that is a huge deal. That is like a really big kind of blow to the world government as an organization, okay? That's more than just like losing some high-ranked members. That is that is a big deal. We have to shut that down as quick as possible. So Kizaru's heading there. Akainu, he takes out his cigar and he's just like, you know, tell Luchi, tell Luchi to not engage Straw Hat under any circumstances. He's not to engage. After this, we immediately cut back to Egghead, where Luffy is engaging Luchi under extreme circumstances. <laughs> Alright, he's like, tell, tell Luchi to not engage Straw Hat under any circumstances. Immediately, match cut. Luffy, please, quit attacking! <laughs> you know, so they're fighting. They're fighting in the middle of the city. Jinbei is even yelling to him. Jinbei's running away with Bonnie, and, and he's just like, Luffy, are you sure you want to do this? This is like a big deal. Alright, you are a Yonko. You are now on a government island fighting against one of the top-ranked assassins of Cypherpole. Like, this is just not gonna be, like, you know, knock him out and call it a day. This, this is gonna be a big event, alright? This is gonna make the news, alright? Luffy doesn't care because guess what? He's already in gear fifth, alright? You know, Jinbei's trying to reason with him. Luffy's already been in gear fifth at this point, man. Okay. So, uh, there's also Chopper in his, uh, in his, um, uh, uh, Kung Fu points. Sorry, Chopper's the one holding Bonnie. Uh, Jinbei grabbed Atlas, because Atlas is obviously really big. So Jinbei lifts Atlas up, he gets her out of there, and uh, all the scientists are running away. Uh, Chopper's like, wait, Luffy, please don't start yet! So the fight is just happening, and like, you know, you can just imagine, like, the, just the armament hockey pouring off these characters alone, plus the conquerors from Luffy. We don't get a confirmation if Luchi has conquerors, but... I don't know, there's there's some stuff here that I guess you could imply that he does. Um, but anyway, it's just wrecking the town. Like, buildings are falling down and everything like that, okay? So now we uh, we cut back to the Labosphere, where the Straw Hats are still, like, you know, magnetized to the floor. They still can't go anywhere. They're there watching the battle on the screen with Shaka, and then, boom, that's when the real Vegapunk appears. So, like, last chapter, he, like, teleported. He can, like, warp using science. So he warps into the lab, and he's just like, ah, is Luffy in that white form, you know, what's going on with the battle, let me see. And then, you know, Frankie sees uh, Vegapunk walk in, the real Vegapunk, and like hearts go into, you know, Frankie's eyes. He's like, oh my god, are you the real Dr. Vegapunk? He's like, yes I am, but we're watching the fight now. <laughs> we're watching the fight. Shaka, go heat up some uh, popcorn. Yes, sir, I'll go heat up some popcorn. We don't do, would you like extra butter? Yes, but make it science butter. Okay, so they're watching the screen, right? And uh, we're, we're seeing the battle. Uh, Shaka brings up that uh, it's very impressive that Luchi is able to control his awakening. All right, so we get to see Luchi in his zone awakening. This is, this makes sense. I mean, the fact that Luchi's been training for two years, he was really strong back at Eddie's Lobby anyway. The one power-up that I think everybody was expecting Luchi to have at this point was his zone awakening, all right? Um, however, Shaka brings up that most awakened zones tend to lose their sense of self. They tend to lose their mind a bit. However, Luchi is able to maintain his own, you know, his own sanity, okay? So, a couple of things before we get into the design of how Lucci looks now in his uh, awakened form, because it's interesting stuff. Um, this is, I think, a mention, a callback to the demon guards at Impel Down, alright? Because remember, We've seen some awakened zones before. Luffy is an awakened zone. Kaido was definitely an awakened zone. And um, the thing is, though, those were both mythical, 
All right, maybe Sengoku as well. I mean, Sengoku is a really powerful character. He was pretty old. He probably awakened the Daibutsu zone as well. Thing is, those were all awakened mythical zones, okay? Which maybe you could say the rules for those are a little bit different. But here, this is an awakened regular zone. And we don't get to see a lot of those, okay? Pretty much just the Demon Guards and maybe Chopper's Monster Point. And that's pretty much it, okay? So uh, with the Demon Guards, though, back in Impel Down, uh, they took the form of like their, their like most of their bodies were their animals except they stood on two legs like Minotaros was the cow zone so he still looked like a cow he still stood on two legs and he just had like his chest section that was like his rippling abs from when he was a human and he didn't really seem to have much of his own personality anymore uh, they didn't talk they did not you know actually be able to even use language they were just like Moo! you know and that was pretty much it and then they were whipped by um, Sadie they they were whipped by Sadie Chan, and they were like, okay, you know, you go over there and you, you know, attack those prisoners. And then the demon guards were like, all right. And they didn't even say, all right. They're like, oh. And then they go and do it. You know, that's like what they, that's all they could do. Like, they're kind of mindless beings that are just listening to Sadie, okay? So that's what, how most awakened zones go. And also, that falls in line with Chopper. When Chopper went into his monster point uh, for the first time back at Enny's Lobby, when he just downed the three Rumble Balls. Um, and now maybe Chopper, yes, has awakened his human human fruit, uh, but he's also taken drugs. So the drugs might also have something to do with the way it actually looks. Um, that's something that people have brought up before, like Chopper had the human-human fruit, so wouldn't his awakening look make him look more human, not make him look more like a reindeer? But you have to also account for drugs, okay? Um, you know, the rumble ball is a hell of a drug, let me tell you. So anyway, though, now we see Lucci and he's in control, except his awakening does not look like um, the demon guards at Impel Down. I mean, it does, but there's some added e extra stuff to it. Most notably, Lucci now has like these flames coming off of him. Uh, it looks like his leopard fur, but it also looks like flames. And it, it bears a very strong resemblance to whenever Luffy goes into his gear fourth and he's got the steam billowing off of him, like he's the Nyo statue or whatever, you know, like he's got the steam ribbon behind him. It looks like that. Um, I don't know if this is actual like fire that's like flaming off of him or if it's just his fur that takes the appearance of fire but it looks very similar to Luffy's gear fourth which you know adds even more of the believability to like yeah Luffy had a mythical zone it wasn't a paramecia so it would make sense this is like Luchi's version of gear fourth okay I guess although it's his awakening now Luffy's fruit is a mythical it's something different this is just a normal zone okay carnivorous zone but still normal okay uh, it's not ancient or mythical or anything like that so um, I, I just wanted to draw the parallels to that there Luchi himself doesn't really look all that different from his hybrid he just looks a little bit bigger and his body is shaped like a little bit differently like a little bit more slimmed down compared to his like big bulky hybrid he just looks like a form that is the best suited for agility and speed but also destructive force like he's getting the best of all of the worlds in this one form Lucci's monster point I guess you could say or his awakened leopard whatever you want to call it okay but there are similarities to gear forth here okay he's like oh yes straw hat you know I've gotten a lot stronger too since the last time we fought so you know don't think this will be easy and uh, once again I wanted to bring up that like he's not really out to fight Luffy because he has this kind of crazy grudge against him it's just like hey I want to prove how strong I've really gotten the only person to really beat me down in some crazy capacity was Luffy. So if I can beat Luffy here, that really proves that I'm, you know, back to being one of the strongest members, uh, you know, in the world, like at the Cypher Pole, you know, definitely. So uh, they go to fight. Um, we cut back to the lab, though, where Vegapunk is there, and he's uh, asking the Straw Hats about the form that Luffy's in, because Luffy just jumped immediately to Gear 5th. So Vegapunk's like, ah, yes, hey, uh, he asks Nami. He's like, I would like to know, Nami, um, what's the deal with Luffy's new form? You know, his whole body he goes white in the hair and he's smiling and he's bouncing around you know well, what's happening with that do you know anything more Vegapunk's gathering information that's kind of what he does and uh, Nami's like we don't really know what this is he used this against Kaido I think um, isn't it just one of his gummo gummo no me powers and Vegapunk is like mm, yes you know it's interesting that you would bring that up you see the gummo gummo no me actually does not appear in any of the old uh, Devil Fruit encyclopedias, or the old Devil Fruit encyclopedia. So, there are Devil Fruit encyclopedias. 
Um, I would actually like to think at this moment in the story, the recent editions, like the edition that uh, Sanji read when he was a little kid and he learned about like the clear, clear fruit and everything like that. Uh, you know, Blackbeard also had one, so he was researching the Yami Yami no Mi. Those were editions that might have been actually published by Vegapunk, and they might have been based off of an older document that might be like the Devil Fruit Codex or something, like this really old book from antiquity, and it might actually have full records of every Devil Fruit, because the encyclopedia that exists now. It's missing certain devil fruits. Not everything is in there. Uh, not every devil fruit itself is actually in you know, the image of what they look like is in the book. Um, there's not like a full compendium, all right? And that might actually be on purpose. Maybe the government, you know, when Vegapunk maybe wanted to publish this book, maybe the government got a hold of it and omitted a few, all right? Maybe they ripped out some information. But there might be like an original devil fruit encyclopedia from the void century from the ancient kingdom that actually records all all of them. Well, not all of them, but the ones that might have existed back then. So now, this is where we're getting into what Devil Fruits really are. Um, a couple of other things, because I really don't want to miss anything. Uh, but he mentions, yeah, the Gamu Gamu no Mi is not listed in any of the Devil Fruit encyclopedias. I don't think it's a Devil Fruit. And Usopp's like, well, that's what Luffy always called it. Luffy always called it the Gamu Gamu no Mi ever since we've known him. Okay, so what do you mean it isn't a Devil Fruit? And, uh, you know, he looks at the screen, Vegapunk, and he's like, well, the, the form that Luffy's in right now, it is eerily similar. It's exactly similar to the sun god of freedom, Nika, that would, you know, purportedly give a smile to everybody's face and bring about freedom and hope to all that have seen him. All right, he looks exactly like a straight-up god that was discussed in these, like, religions and things like that. Probably most of them have been wiped by the government. He even brings this up. Um, you, you know, uh, Nami even says, I've never heard the name Sun God Nika before. And uh, Vegapunk's, well, like, of course you wouldn't. It's been, everything's been scrubbed by the government. Everything's, everything's been erased. You got to imagine, like, when the world government took over, whatever religions were around prior to that, you know, the government probably shoved them out because the government kind of became its own religion on the planet. You know, there's other references to religion in One Piece, but, like, the government sort of is set up as, like, you're supposed to worship the Tenryu Obito as gods. That's kind of the setup, right? As long as desire persists, such a thing will never cease to be. So Vegapunk saying, even though the government removed all traces of the sun god, removed all traces of the fruit that embodies this form, it doesn't matter because you can't remove it all from history. As long as desire persists, then uh, things will never cease to be. We owe all there is to desire, including the devil fruits themselves. All right, this is your last chance. I'm telling you what, we're gonna find out some hot news about Devil Fruits. This is some big news. Not just big news, this is biggest news. This is ultimate news. This is mega evolution news. This is Gigantamax news, all right? All right, are you ready for this? Okay. Devil Fruits are the physical manifestation about how different aspects of evolution are going to play out. The desire for different aspects of evolution to play out. He gives an example if that didn't make any sense. He says, you know, when humans are sitting around and they're thinking, gee, I wish I could do X, or man, it would be really cool if I could do, you know, Y, you know, it's just like these different examples. It is through those inherent desires that devil fruits are created. Okay, now like I said, this doesn't explain everything. Each one showcases a different possibility for the future of humanity. Now, because of this, because they deviate from the path of evolution, because they are deviating from what is natural in our world, um, they're kind of breaking the aspect of what it is to be natural. Um, they are unnatural, which means that Mother Sea doesn't like them very much, which is why Devil Fruit users live this alien existence where they cannot swim, all right? Because the, the Sea Mother, like, just, you know, despises the essence of what Devil Fruits are, okay? Now... Pause right there. I mean, this is obviously, I mean, this could honestly be like its own series at this point, but yeah, we'll be making a follow up about this, obviously. But uh, initial thoughts on this. Okay. 
Let's start by talking about things that about Devil Fruits that have always bugged me personally. Things that I've always looked at Devil Fruits and like, okay, whenever Oda does explain this, this is going to be a little off. This is going he has to explain certain things. One thing that's always weirded me out about Devil Fruits is, you know, you have Devil Fruits that are like elements, okay? Like lightning, snow, cold, heat, you know, that kind of stuff. And that makes sense, you know, like there are natural elements that occur in the world. Uh, maybe the earth, you know, had a tree and then, you know, oh, here's the magma fruit or something like that, right? The, the problem is all of the wacky paramecia abilities, right? Like, there's the, the jacket fruit, there's the buki buki no me, which is Baby Five's arms arms fruit that allows her to turn into various weapons. There's uh, Suru's wash wash fruit, which literally embodies the concept of laundry. You know, not the concept of soap, not the concept of water, but the concept of laundry. Alright, so it's like, this is weird. This is, you cannot write this off as a natural occurring thing. And it's the exact opposite of that, so okay. But you also have to think that like there's some kind of mechanism that's involved here, right? For devil fruits to be created. So the general vibe is there's like, let's say like a bunch of humans are sitting around. Let's let's use an easy one. Let's use flight, the uh, the ability to fly. Humans have been thinking about that for in our world for thousands of years. As long as humans have existed and were capable of critical thinking skills, and they saw a bird, they were probably thinking back in the Stone Age, like, hey, Ugg, wouldn't it be cool if we could fly like bird? Oh, don't be silly, ooh. We can't fly. We know wings. Oh, that makes sense. It'd be cool if we could fly, though. I go back to Cave and draw on Cave. Comic book of me with wings. Okay, ooh. And that's how Ugg was the first cartoonist on the entire planet. But no, I'm not kidding. That seriously, like, might have happened that way, okay? Like, so let's say a bunch of the collective desires, the collective wishing of humans were like, man, I wish I could fly, gave birth to, well, Shiki's Fuwa Fuwa no Mi, which allows him to fly, or all the different bird zones. The desire to, no, it might be different. The desire to be a bird gave birth to the bird zones. The desire to fly gave birth to the Fuwa Fuwa no Mi. The, you know, every human being, at one point or another, has thought about what would it be like to be an animal. I'm not going in the furry direction with this. I'm just saying. Hashtag not a furry. I'm just saying. At some point in like every human being's life, you've thought, even if you were like a little kid, and you're like, man, it'd be cool to be a rhinoceros or something. You know, like, yeah, it happens. So every single, that maybe that's why zones exist. Every single, man, it'd be cool if I was a dragon. You know, it just, roar, there's Kaido's zone right there. You know, every other human, it's like, man, it'd be really cool if I could control electricity. Boom, there's the, the Goro Goro to me. Man, it'd be really cool if I could control earthquakes. Boom! There's the Gura Gura no me right there, okay? Now, we still don't know the mechanism of how this works, because I don't think it's as simple as, like, let's say there's some kid working on a farm down in the South Blue, and he's just, like, raking the, you know, he's plowing the field or whatever, and he, you know, got all these, like, crappy, like, wooden tools, and he's just like, man, I wish it would be easier to plow this field. I wish I had access to some kind of, like, farming power. And then all of a sudden, like, the fruit just appears in front of him, like, whoom, whoom. He, and that's when Billy ate the farm, farm fruit. He can make all the farms. He can farm all the XP in one setting. And you gotta be watching out for Billy. Billy's gonna be a Yonko in a couple of years. But no, anyway, I don't think it's like that. I don't think it's, it's that simple. But what might happen is maybe when there's more people that want the same thing, like the desire to fly, a lot of humans have thought about that over the course of history. So therefore, maybe because more people desired it, the fruit came into existence a lot earlier or a lot faster. Maybe it, it, it's like a, it takes time. So it's like a very specific thing. Maybe it takes a while for the fruit to grow. Uh, maybe it is instant, but like, okay, so let's go back to the Billy example. Billy is farming and he's like, man, I wish I could, you know, grow things faster or whatever. That fruit might come into existence, some kind of devil fruit that accelerates growth, maybe the mature, mature fruit that Shinobu had, but it's not going to appear right in front of the person that desired it. It's going to appear somewhere else in the world. Although, I will say, at the same time, there's a lot of characters in One Piece that have devil fruits that seem perfectly suited to their own personality and desire. Vegapunk is a perfect example of that. He literally has the brain brain fruit. What if Vegapunk was desiring man? I wish there was an ability. I wish I had infinite space to store all my knowledge. 
and then that created the brain brain fruit. Maybe not right in front of him. Maybe that's how he proved this. Maybe that's how he tested his hypothesis. Scientific method, everybody. That's how you do it. All right. He's like, I have a theory. I have a theory that human desire creates devil fruits. I wish I could have the ability to store an infinite amount of energy. I mean, not an infinite amount of energy. Well, technically infinite amount of knowledge in my brain, infinite storage space. And then he scoured the world and he found the fruit that he himself created and then ate it and gained the power. And that's how he proved his hypothesis. Maybe, 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 I don't know. Uh, but, 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 where's the person that's controlling this? Where's the person that sets the rules? Basically, it has to be some kind of God, all right? Because it's like the desire, out of this desire, things just get created. That seems like something that there has to be a God up there that's like, okay, this is the way I'm setting it up. You know, if the humans desire things enough, their desires will manifest in the physical form. Maybe it's Sun God Nika, because then also we're getting the sea involved. And uh, Vegapunk specifically mentions Mother Nature or Mother Sea. So also, why does the sea matter? So there's like, there has to be like, these metaphysical forces that are acting, you know, beyond human realms of capabilities and capacity here, okay? If there was a god of, like, desire, and that god of desire is where the devil fruits, like, the mechanism for how they're created through human wishes and desires, maybe that god is doesn't really get along too much with Mother C over here. You know, I don't know if this is going to be some kind of Kaguya crap, like from Naruto, where in the last minute of the story, all of a sudden, wait, we have a rabbit goddess from, from that's an alien that shows up out of nowhere. I don't know. But, like, it, it, it implies right here, like, you know, put that on the back burner, okay? The, the, the back burner. The last enemy of this story might be Mother Ocean. It might be Eam. <laughs> Who knows, you know? Like, that might be Eam right then and there. Um, you know, there, there's a popular theory out there that Eam is a woman. So, maybe Eam is Mother Ocean or whatever, the Mother Sea, okay? Uh, who knows? Um, and so... Um, yeah, they mentioned that they, you know, they live a totally alien existence. There, there's so much more I wanted to discuss here. Oh, yeah, 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 it's that, actually. Okay, um, we're going to be getting into a little bit of, like, real-life philosophy here. I, I, I'm sorry, but I have this philosophy book, okay? And it doesn't go into great detail on, like, every single philosopher, but it's a philosophy book that basically just covers all the major philosophers throughout human history and just covers, you know, the basics of what they were talking about. Obviously can't include everything of every single philosopher, but it includes the big ones, you know, like Socrates is in there. That's where I, you know, that's where I read about Pythagoras, you know, like, it's in this book, okay? And, um, I have it, but it's upstairs. I'm not gonna go grab it. Okay, so there's a philosopher by the name of a uh, German philosopher by the name of Ludwig Andreas uh, Feuerbach. Uh, I, I can't speak German, so sorry, I probably butchered his name. But his thing, and he was an atheist that mostly dealt with, like, the philosophy around God, okay? And there's something that he theorized that he kind of came up with that is eerily similar to this. And it's the idea that, you know, it wasn't God that existed first and then created the earth and the universe and humans and everything like that. God is a human construct out of our desires, okay? Like humans vaunt aspects of personality like kindness. Let's take kindness, for example. Like, is like, you know, so out of that desire for kindness and for others to be kind, human beings created a God that is kind to the maximum possible degree. Uh, compassionate to the maximum possible degree, you know, not just a god, but any god. This applies to any sort of, uh, you know, pantheon of gods, you know, Greek, Roman, Norse, Japanese, you know, any sort of god throughout history. He's basically talking about how, you know, it's the ultimate desire for these perfect beings that humans wanted. Like, if there was a being that was perfectly compassionate to the ma maximum possible degree, or a being that was uh, perfectly capable of controlling the weather, or a being that was blah, 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 and, you know, gods are human inventions because of that. So, therefore, the study of theology is the study of anthropology. Therefore, like, they're interconnected, okay? Um, that was just something I read, and I was reading this chapter, and it's like, wow, this is kind of similar, where we're getting metaphysical with it. We're getting, like, desires create physical manifestation of those desires, okay? Now, I have one last question before we move on, and I will discuss this at length in another video, probably several. But one more thing that is still unanswered that I need to know right here and now. 
Who was it on the damn planet that desired the jacket fruit? The answer was me. <laughs> the answer was me the whole time. The jacket jacket fruit. Ah, yes. Now, the thing is, I've always been a fan of jackets. So way back in the day, well before Dress Rosa, I thought about how it would be cool if there was a devil fruit that jackets existed. Ha, there you go. There it is right there, yeah. But now, there had to be somebody in the One Piece world that was like, man, I really wish I could turn into a jacket and other people could wear me. And he went on and on about this every single day until the jacket fruit was born. And uh, also, it brings up something else. Um, devil fruits have to still be being created, right? Like, um, another question I always had was uh, Baby Five's Buki Buki Nomi, the arms arms fruit, allowing her to turn into various weaponry. Um, I mean, I guess we now know that the Ancient Kingdom was advanced, but like, you know, let's say, like, like, would Devil Fruits be able to come into existence now? Like, if, um, for example, uh, you know, let's say nuclear energy was discovered in the One Piece world, right? Maybe the nuclear energy was what was powering the Iron Giant, but let's just assume it wasn't. Let's say Vegapunk invents nuclear power. Would there therefore then become, like, a people that begin to desire, like, man, I wish I could run on nuclear power, and then a nuclear Devil Fruit is born. Like, so more and more new Devil Fruits have to be being created down the line. It, it doesn't make sense that they'd be born in a single batch, and they're reincarnating. It's like throughout human history, as long as humans exist and have desire, then more and more would be created, right? So, yeah, that's another angle to take it. Um, Vegapunk wraps this up, and by the way, Usopp, Frankie, Sanji, Nami, they're all like, are we finding out about the, like, because no, no, no regular citizen in the One Piece world knows anything about where Devil Fruits come from. There's probably thousands of theories out there on where these things come from, but nobody knows anything. But then there's Vegapunk, who's like the one person that might actually have something to go on here. So if you're going to buy anybody's theories on Devil Fruits, buy Vegapunks, okay? I'm sure there's a bunch of other drunks in a bar somewhere that are just like, hey, Sam, where do you think Devil Fruits come from? I think Devil Fruits come from space. <laughs> You know, like it's you know, there's a lot of theories out there, but Vegapunk's the one that might actually have the best chance of actually being real, okay? Um, and so to end this out, Vegapunk says, hey, listen, and this is a nice little touch on this that Oda is kind of throwing in as well. Uh, Vegapunk says, hey, listen, whether or not you believe that gods exist, you know, whether or not you believe that gods are the ones that are like messing with us here or created this concept or whatever, one thing is for sure, we live in a truly wondrous world. So that's the thing that Vegapunk is more interested in, okay? Like, let's say there are gods. Let's say there are, like, a, panth a pantheon of gods in the One Piece world that are, like, messing with everything. Um, you know, as a scientist, Vegapunk is like, you know, that's, like, so far beyond our, like, like, like they can just, like, you know, they're, they're, like, on another realm of reality. Might as well kind of more just enjoy the ride of what we have right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, whether or not you want to believe gods are up there and they're making devil fruits or they're giving us the ability to make devil fruits or whatever, that's fine. You can believe whatever you want. But what's really true, what really I'm focusing on is, this is a crazy world we live in, and I'm enjoying every second of it, and I'm going to try to figure out as much as I can. You know, that's Vegapunk right there, and it's crazy, okay? Um... So, we now cut back. We're not even done with the chapter yet. We still got, like, several pages to go here. Uh, but, yeah, they, like, Vegapunk doesn't reveal this at the end of the chapter. He reveals it right in the middle, okay? So, we cut back to the fight, um, and uh, we have Sentomaru arriving. So, Sentomaru is there. Uh, he is the personal bodyguard of Vegapunk. He's also an official Marine. It was his day off, so that's why we didn't see him up, and see him up until now. Uh, but Sentomaru shows up. He's got S. Snake, S. Uh, Shark, and S. Hawk with him, okay? So, the Seraphim, Boa, Jinbei, and Mihawk. All right, so they're all there. They're all ready for battle. And uh, Sentomaru is like, hey, uh, you know, Grandpa Vegapunk, you know, it's my day off. You know, okay, what am I supposed to be doing here? Well, I guess, you know, the Cypherpole are here, and we work for the government. So the Cypherpole works for the government, and pirates are invading. So this seems like a pretty cut-and-dry sort of situation. Uh, push back the pirates, right? And Dr. Vegapunk is communicating with uh, Sentomaru, like, actually... It's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm going to need you to actually chase off Cypherpole if you could. And Sentomaru was like, wait a second, doesn't that mean that we're 
uh, traitors to the government then? And Vegapunk's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess we would be. It's okay. You don't actually, you know what? Don't mind. You don't have to do it. Um, I just rescued you from poverty when you were a child. You were starving to death. I gave you a warm place to sleep and some food and gave you a job. But yeah, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. So he's he's really pulling the, you know, even Centomara says, like, oh, pull my arm, why don't you? You're really laying the guilt trip on me there. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, actually, you can help the CP0. I just saved your life and everything. I guess it doesn't matter much to you. So there you go. And so Centomaru is just like, okay, all right, you know what? Push the suits back, all right? So that he orders the Seraphim to attack Cypherpool Zero. But remember, Cypherpool also has a Seraphim on their side. They have S Bear, all right? So they order S Bear to attack. However, Centomaru is like, S Bear, belay that order. Attack the suits, you know? And so S Bear is like, override confirmed <laughs> and then starts to attack cypher pull zero so we start to learn here that the um, command structure of the seraphim has a hierarchy okay the top of the hierarchy is the five elders then it's dr vegapunk and his satellites that makes sense that that would be included because you know like there's a constant fear that vegapunk's getting too powerful he's creating inventions that could maybe take over the world so it would make sense that when vegapunk was developing the seraphim the gorosei specifically told told Vegapunk, we are going to have the highest authority of the Seraphim. Okay, the, we are going to be the ones that order them to kind of like as a fail save to make sure that Vegapunk doesn't order them to destroy the world. Now, I could still argue that Vegapunk could have just said that he programmed. Like, it's not like the Gorosei are going to be able to know. The Gorosei don't know, you know, complicated technology, you know, like wiring and coding and stuff like that. So Vegapunk could have told them like, oh yeah, 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 you're at the highest command structure. You're at the highest, no matter what, even over me, you will, they, they will obey your orders, Gorosei. The Gorosei is like, okay. But he might have just, you know, made a fail safe for that or a backup for that, you know? It's like Vegapunk's like, you know, override command code 3264 Alpha Omega. And then all of a sudden the Seraphim will listen to only Vegapunk, you know? He could have easily done that. But anyway, it goes five elders, then Vegapunk and the satellites, then Sentomaru, then anybody with an authority chip. So I guess you have to have like an authority chip on you, like to, like the, the, the uh, Seraphim scans and like, oh, yes, uh, you know, detection of authority chip detected. Therefore, I will obey the Cypher Pool Zero, okay? But Sentomaru overrides the authority chip. So uh, Stussy and Kaku probably have their chips on them, but it doesn't matter because there's a command structure. So that means S Bear and all the other Seraphim are going to listen to Sentomaru and not the Cypher Pole. So S Bear is now attacking them. Okay, we now cut back over to Luchi fighting against Luffy. And this is something I should bring up. Um, there was uh, a few different spoilers for this chapter that were out earlier this week, if you read any of them. And uh, one of the first uh, spoilers was um, the fight between Luffy and Luchi is essentially like Tom and Jerry, because Luffy has the gear fifth, and then Luchi is a cat, so therefore cartoon, so therefore Tom and Jerry. And it also mentioned that like Luffy essentially just, you know, just like crushed Luchi in like one attack. So that doesn't happen. Clearly, Luffy has the upper hand. He's in gear fifth. Um, Luchi is still a powerhouse. Uh, he doesn't get defeated by the end of this chapter. He takes a few hits from gear fifth Luffy. He doesn't go down. I made a whole video talking about how maybe Luchi would be maybe a little bit faster than Luffy and stuff like that. Clearly is not the case, so I'm wrong on that one. But it wasn't a one-hit KO, all right? It wasn't like Luffy just gear fifth, boom, and then Luchi's just, like, pops out like an accordion, like, Rip. of course you know, Straw Hat, this means war, you know? It wasn't like that. Um, Luffy uses a technique where uh, it's Gamu Gamu no Mole Pistol, and so he punches the ground, but because anything he comes in contact with turns into rubber because of his awakening, hits the ground, the rubber then goes under the ground, and like the ground pops up like Silly Putty, boom, punches Luchi right in the stomach. So it's like Luffy punches the ground over there, and then his fist travels under the ground, and then boom, punches you. So Luchi's not seeing this crap coming, all right? So he gets hit, he's coughing up blood. Um, Sentomaru orders, you know, lead the Straw Hats to the uh, vacuum rocket and get them to the dome, get them to the labosphere. Uh, Jinbei witnesses his own seraphim, so he's just like... Oh, what the hell? Seriously, picture this. Picture Jinbei running across a clone of himself. It's like, what the... Did they clone us? Did they take our DNA? Did they take my blood and use it to make a clone? 
what the? I'm glad I left the government, man. This is getting too weird. You know, Jean Bay is like having kind of an existential crisis here. It's just like, don't do they, do they seriously clone us? Actually, he says it more like he's not freaking out. He says it more like he's like a like a like a disappointed dad. You know, it's just like, oh, don't tell me they cloned us. Oh, really? We got to deal with that today. All right. You know, okay. But anyway, yeah, Jean Bay finds out about that. He's like, oh yeah, aren't those also the warlords too? Like there's Boa and there's Mihawk. And you know, I was like, okay, that's all right. Oh my God. There's Kuma that's there. Um, after Luffy punches, oh, and also, by the way, earlier in the chapter, th this was in the middle of the whole explanation with the Devil Fruits, we see Luchi and Luffy f uh, clash. We see them, like, throw a punch at each other. There's another scene where, um, and Luchi is fast. He's just not as fast as Gear 5th. He has his, like, his claws, his, like, armament hockey, razor-sharp, awakened leopard zone claws. And he's, like, trying to, like, stab the crap out of Luffy. But Luffy just takes his head and is just, like, moving it around. Like, the Devil Fruit is Luffy's head, so just like, He's like, ha ha, you can't hit me, you can't hit me, ha 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 ha, you know, and Luchi's like, oh, come on, really? You know, so Luffy's definitely faster than Luchi, all right. Uh, maybe in a straight up foot race, I don't know, but in this, like, reaction time, definitely faster. But there is a shot where they both charge up armament, and they clash, and the fist meet, and then... Boom, they, go, they both get knocked back, you know, to various walls. So it's not like Luffy punched Luchi and then he ultimately won out. They both kind of got knocked back by the shockwave. So, you know, Luchi, I mean, definitely Luffy's going to win. He has the edge here, but, like, it's, it's not a one-shot kind of quick-ass fight that a lot of people were thinking it was going to be. So whatever, I'll take what I can get. Anyway, after Luffy punches Luchi with the mole gun, um, he goes over to visit uh, Sentomaru, because he's still hopping around like in his Gear 5th form, and he's smiling, and he's just like, Oh, hey, you're the axe guy! Hey, it's been a while! And Sentomaru's like, Luffy, Straw Hat, we're not friends. I don't know why you're talking to me anyway. Um, by the way, are you going to take uh, you know Grandpa Vegapunk off this island? And Luffy's like, Oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Don't don't worry, he asked me to. Sentamaro's like, ah, I don't know about that. I don't really know if I trust you. And then as they're having this conversation, Luchi just storms in, telling you what, using handgun, which is like an advanced form of Shigon, okay? So Shigon is just the normal finger pistol. Imagine Luchi, crazy powerful strength, awaken zone, clawed leopard hand, armament hockey, razor sharp fangs, he shreds through Sentomaru like he's made of freaking butter, all right? It's just like, so that's another thing too. Like Luffy's dealing with Luchi kind of no problem. This guy is still a walking paper shredder, okay? This guy is still just like a wheat thresher when it comes to damage, okay? One swing from Luchi's like arm could probably like slice apart entire buildings, okay? It's just that Luffy is stronger. He's, you know, in the sun god form or whatever. And so, you know, Luchi knocks him down. Luffy's there, and he's like, oh, battle axe guy! And Luchi's just like, just gotta cut down the, to the command structure then. We get rid of Sentomaru, the Seraphim will listen to us again. You know, and that's that's true, you know, it's like Sentomaru's higher up, then we just have to eliminate Sentomaru, and then they go back to whoever has the authority chip, so the Seraphim will default back to, Lu uh, not back to Luchi, okay? So that means unless some of the satellites or Vegapunk himself get involved and start issuing orders. Um, and also, it was mentioned by Stussy that um, they cannot take orders via transponder snail, via the Denden Den Mushi. So that's why they can't just call up the Gorosei and be like, Gorosei, please give the Seraphim an order. That won't work. So that the if the satellites are going to do this, Shaka cannot just like pick up a Denden Den Mushi and deliver an order. They have to physically be there. So Atlas is gone. Sentomaru is gone. Uh, I don't think Sentomaru is getting back. Up. I mean, Luchi just, I mean, it, it was brutal, okay? And that's the end of the chapter, okay? He's like, now, Seraphim, obey us. So now, Luchi, like I said, Luchi's not, like, he's not, like, like about to fall or something like that. He's not, like, ugh, ugh, my last act was to defeat Sentomaru. Luffy, you're too strong. <laughs> no, he, just, he seems like he's still, like, in fighting shape. And then he defeats Sentomaru, and he's like, Seraphim, obey us. So now Luffy might have to deal with all four of these Seraphim. Jinbei, Mihawk, Boa, and, uh, and uh, Kuma, and Esper, all fighting Luffy. So we're going to see where this goes. Um... God, there's just so much. This is one of those chapters where you get to the end of it. And there's a break next week, by the way. I think I heard there's like a, actually a break that's going to be multiple weeks, but I don't know that for certain. But there is a break next week. Um, 
So, I don't even... Uh, th th okay, one more thing I wanted to bring up. Um, so, uh, another angle you could look at the existence of Nika, the sun god, was, uh, you know, you could have looked at it like, what if, you know, the sun god existed as an actual god? Like, an actual, like, before humans existed, before the earth existed, there was Nika, the sun god, right? A and then everything else happened. Well, because now we're finding out this crap about devil fruits and desire and everything, what if it was the collective desire of all of the slaves of the world, after the world world government came together and started enslaving the whole populations. What if the slaves wished for hope, wished for freedom, and it was through that desire that generated the sun god fruit, and that's what they called it, the sun god, hope. All right, freedom, joy, happiness. So it might be a situation like that where instead of like gods creating man, like happens in a lot of creation myths in our world, we have man creating gods. And this goes back to the uh, the Ludwig Feuerbach kind of thing. So maybe, but like I said, this is this is a lot to unpack. This is a lot to unpack here. Um, but Lucci is still fighting, and now the Seraphim are on his side. So okay, Lucci versus uh, Luffy. Clearly, Luffy had the edge, but now it's Lucci plus a clone of Mihawk, a clone of Boa, a clone of Kuma, and a clone of Jinbei, all fighting Luffy together now. Let's stress test this gear fifth. Let's push it to the limits. <laughs> All right, let's see where we go with that. Um, oh, there was one other point I wanted to make about gear. Oh, yeah. Luffy doesn't go with gear fourth anymore. Luffy's default is now, I'm going gear fifth in fighting, and I think that's for two reasons. Number one, it's because he feels the most free, so like, I want to go in that form the most I can. And number two, I think Oda's just wants to have fun with it. Oda's like, I've been waiting for gear fifth. I can have so many fun scenes, like with Luffy dodging out of the way of Luchi's handguns with like the head and just like, haha, you can't hit me, you can't hit me. Like, L Oda wants to have fun drawing Luffy doing all this wacky stuff, so he's gonna, we're just gonna jump to gear fifth. It's not like one of those things where like, go Goku learns Ultra Instinct at the end of the Tournament of Power, and then after the tournament, he's like, yeah, sorry, Vegeta, I can't go back into it again. I don't know why. You know, it takes a few more arcs for him to get to it. You know, no, no. It's just like, Luffy could go into gear fifth whenever he wants, so we're gonna do that. All right, well, this is already a long video. Uh, I don't know, man, just... Give me a theory on Devil Fruits. Uh, you know what? More than anything, I want to know the Jacket Fruit. Tell me the story. Somebody tell me the story of how the Jacket Fruit came into existence. If you can just give me that for Christmas, I'll be happy. All right? And the laundry fruit, too, I guess. Well, then, the laundry fruit I can get. The laundry fruit, Suru's fruit, I can understand. Maybe there's, like, an overworked housewife or grandma somewhere. And she's like, oh, I wish I had the ability to do laundry instantly. And then that's probably how that fruit came into existence. But, uh, you know, the jacket fruit, that's... Maybe just somebody really liked jackets. I don't... I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it.